Hello and welcome everyone to the Games Institute. Um, we're going to get started. Uh, uh, the Games Institute, as um, some of you might know, is an interdisciplinary research center at the University of Waterloo and um, with the objective of advancing the study of interactive and immersive technologies and experiences. And today, as part of the workshop, uh, workshop series um, organized by the uh, G Games Institute um, Anti-Racism, Decolonization, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee. We have a panel on and a discussion on indigenous research and epistemologies. Uh, and, and today we have um, two, two speakers, uh, Kelly Lorilla. Uh, she's an indigenous Sami and Irish woman with uh, close to 30 years of Anishinaabe knowledge and experiences, uh, some career indigenous woman in girls from Ferkel in community and in a federal uh, penitentiary, social worker and educator. And she's also an advanced advocate for ideology and social policy change pertaining to systemic social and justice practices in, in, impacting indigenous peoples. Uh, dialogue about the colonization and movement towards action is at the forefront of her work uh, with reconciliation initiatives. And myself, Hector Perez, uh, nice to meet you everyone. I'm a postdoc working at the Faculty of Health here at University of Waterloo. I work with uh, indigenous first responders to develop training materials um, on how to address dementia related missing incidents. So that's uh, much of the work that I'm doing. I also will move to the territorial acknowledgement and then uh, we'll do our uh, marching ceremony. I would like to acknowledge that um, uh, the Games Institute recognized the uh, presence and deep tradition and knowledge, laws, laws, and philosophies of our indigenous people who, with whom we share the land that we live and work today. And we're working continually to make the space for indigenous scholars, designers, commentators, and creators, and to uplift all voices that are marginalized in both the academic and gaming communities. We acknowledge that the land on which we work and live today is the traditional uh, land of the Atawandaron, Anishinaabeg, and Haudenosaunee peoples. The University of Waterloo, where we work, is situated on the Handyman track, which includes 10 kilometers on either side of the Grand River. And our ability to work and live here now in the Waterloo region in Ontario is a direct benefit of policies of ex expulsion and assimilation of uh, indigenous peoples during settlement and confederation and since then and as beneficiaries uh, we're responsible for recognizing and comprehending the history and present day experience of first nations inuit and Metis peoples we must utilize this understanding in our work to put an end to perpetuating the harmful effects of colonization and take the first steps towards repairing them um, i hope that this land acknowledgement serves as small step to towards achieving this goal. Uh, without further ado, I will move to the smudging ceremony. So hi, everybody, and uh, those in uh, virtual world. Uh, I, invite, I invite you all into this space, and I'm going to start with um, uh, a ceremony is called smudging, and um, I recognize sometimes you know, we don't pay, take pictures or recording, but I realize that this can be a learning experience too. So I'm actually okay with with um, with the recording happening here. And so I'm going to burn a bit of sage, and it just is a way for me. I've been doing it for I don't know, close to 30 years, and it's just a way for me to. It can be to begin a day. It can be maybe I do it different times in the day, and it's a way to shed off whatever I've been carrying. And uh, sometimes in busy driving traffic, trying to find parking or whatever, and I come into a space and the smudging just kind of clears it away. And, um, and sometimes when I go into different uh, difficult situations, smudging uh, can be helpful. I'm just gonna burn a bit of, uh, we call it medicine, as it's helpful for us.
And so those who are actually present in the room, um, you can, I'll just go around and if you choose to use it or not, that's okay. Or and if you wish to me have you walk by, you can just put your right hand up to your left shoulder. So I'm just going to move that out. I'm just going to uh, smudge the the drums. These drums go a lot of places, um, held by lots of people, and so I just clear clear off any energies that happen to be uh, on them. And in a moment, I'll be asking if anyone here wants to hold a drum or a shaker. <laughs> uh, so I just want to start with some words of. Um, uh, Acknowledgement and thanksgiving. Um, what a baby, if Miladi. Munama le faren porca, Molenechi mel sapnilas, Yalan made your landless sogas, Ernomus gift you, if mel, Yamo veiki, Milet siema delis, Moi furthi filbred brass, me bargained on west of me, bordy to see dilemma. Pick two, it not, if no. Chimigwech, itchimani do. Mawaji and Azakanech gain in addition of ours. Nin Sami and Irish, Kitchener on the like Donjaba. So I give thanks to Creator for my life and for walking with me in my life. And uh, hoping that I'm guided to, to walk in a good way. Um, my spirit name that I was given by Algonquin uh, Sundance Chief Harry Snowboy is Moving Light. She who shines light in, in uh, spaces, maybe it's a difficult conversations, uh, maybe conversations haven't been had. And where I am in my life, that's my second spirit name that I've been given. Um, and I hope that I fulfill that purpose. Um, I also want to give thanks for this beautiful bay and the sunshine that's here. I give thanks for all the standing people, the plant people, the stone people, the winged ones, the creepers, the crawlers, the flyers, the swimmers, the sky people, the star people, to grandfather sun who's beautifully lit our day today and providing that, that warmth, to grandmother moon, who lights our skies at night and pulls those tides of water around the world, to Father Sky who upholds all of creation, and to our First Mother that continues to sustain all of creation, all the beings. Um, she keeps on going. Um, you know, there's been a lot of harms to our First Mother yet she still provides. And so as we care for her more, you know, we get to protect the future generations. And I give thanks for the water that without it, there would not be any life being able to be sustained. So I give thanks for those words. Um, 
I would also, because it relates to the conversation today in a different kinds of ways, but um, I wanted to do song. It's part of my research, but I also, I'm a song carrier, have been so for, I think, 20, since 2002, I'll say that. So um, a long time. And um, so can I enlist somebody to uh, use a drum? And I've got a couple of shakers. Any takers? Someone. Which would you like? Um, I think. Thank you. Shakers. Shakers. All right. <laughs> um, so this song, I learned songs that they were never written down. You just show up and they keep going over and over again. And eventually I would just learn the songs and I would learn the teachings too. This song is a little bit simple, but it also is acknowledging, um, you know, this this opportunity, maybe it's a new experience and just it's a new day, mm. new dawn. And so it's actually, it's a well-known song called the Cherokee Morning Song. And it repeats, once you've heard the first line, it goes over again. So I'm actually going to do it five times, but and the fifth time will, will be without sound. It's to acknowledge those who pass to the spirit world. So we're we're acknowledging and standing still for them because those who passed on are never far away from us. So it'll go five, but typically people pick up the pattern. And so it doesn't matter if you know it or not, or if you make a mistake, creator sees us all. And uh, so all is good in the circle. Um, I stand just because as I get older, I just need lung capacity. <laughs> So Cherokee morning song. <clears throat> so this is the beat uh, that you can get and get with the shakers and the drums like that. When they shuffle, when they shuffle, when they shuffle, Thank you. Thank you. 
this is amazing. All right, so uh, now we're gonna move to the um, questions for our panelists. And uh, well, the first uh, question that I have here is about uh, defining research and cooperation uh, with the indigenous communities. Uh, let's talk about what does that mean for you personally, working with indigenous communities, and also your perspectives on research and cooperation. Yeah, um, research with indigenous communities, I think, absolutely has to be in partnership with, and I probably would say uh, it's relational. It, it can only be relational. Without a relationship, um, I think myself and a lot of Indigenous researchers and scholars would feel it unethical to do relationships. Uh, so the investment of time and energy is needed often before the whole uh, research process um, begins. And, um, and so, uh, you know, sometimes I know in research world, we say participatory uh, research, and, I, and it certainly does fit for uh, Indigenous peoples, um, because uh, there is that saying, nothing about us without us, and that there's been a lot of um, colonial harms, I guess, that we can talk about in a bit, but, uh, but that's why it has to be uh, relationship-oriented. I think too, as I think about the research that I, I've done some research projects with Indigenous peoples and one that is kind of controversial. Um, and uh, it is with a, a police, a, a actually Waterloo Regional Police Corps and an Indigenous women and girls drum circle. And so um, I happen to be you know, where a place where I had previously worked, um, they had all of these community booths set up in the hall. And so lots of just different um, titles on their posters and stuff. And then I saw the word chorus and it caught my attention. And then I looked down at the table and it was the police and I thought, oh, OK. And I just kept on walking um, because I couldn't have imagined actually having a connection with the police when I know of the extraordinary violence that police have committed against Indigenous peoples, particularly Indigenous women and girls. And so I went off to my meeting and three hours later, this booth was still there. And so I'm looking and I look at the course and I again walked by this booth. Um, but then something stopped me in my tracks. And I, I, I'm a spirit, I believe there is a creator, I'm spiritual. And I believe actually creator stopped me because it wasn't in my mind to stop. And so I turned and the man at the table was looking directly at me. So then I thought, oh, okay, we've locked eyes. And so I think I need to go over and say something and it, I went very awkwardly said, oh, I, you sing, of <laughs> course, chorus sings. But I ended up learning something by going to the table. And uh, not only about the police chorus, that uh, they go out into community, they do outreach with various um, people in community in different ways and sing for different community events. And um, so in that regard, they just want to support and build relationships between police and community members. But they had never done one with Indigenous peoples. And, and he had a sense why this might not happen, um, but he didn't know how to shift it. And he said, we would love to have some kind of a partnership with uh, Indigenous peoples. We just don't know how to make it happen. I also learned that this man was, um, uh, he had um, taken supervision of all other officers and civilians to be part of the, um, the Indian settlement agreement. So when survivors uh, came forward for the harms and abuses um, that they had experienced in Indian residential schools. 
this is it's kind of hard but the process of them being able to secure funds maybe not even for themselves but for family members or what they could leave behind um, so it wasn't about the money per se but having acknowledgement and having He said, would you ever be interested in a partnership of singing? And I hesitated and I said, that's a tough ask. Um, but I, he gave me his card and I said, I'll, I'll take this back to the women and girls and I'll get back to you. Not really thinking I would get back to him. But I, uh, I did present it to the drum circle and the girls, you know, who were at the time between 10 and 14 years old. And we had little kids and babies too. Um, but I, uh, I said that this had transpired and just explained the story to them. And I said, is this even something we want to entertain at all? And, um, and some started to think and they said, I don't know. And others said, well, Maybe it could help. And I said, well, why do you think it could help? And they said, well, we would wish for better relations with our, with our kids and our grandkids than what's there now. Maybe something good could come out of it. So by the end of this circle, we did a sharing circle. And, um, and the uh, response from everyone, because everybody kind of had to agree or not agree. We all, if, people weren't on board, then we just wouldn't do it. Because by consensus, this was important for us that we wouldn't leave anybody behind and feeling uncomfortable. Um, and they were willing to at least have a visit from the chair. So him, he came to another meeting and uh, it was a really awkward silence. And um, he came with one of his, uh, one of the other, Police Corps members. And so it began a bit of sharing, and we actually did that a number of times um, before we could ever consider it. And um, I had known these women, some of them for over 10 years, you know, so I knew them quite well. And uh, so we had a lot of this over the next year. It was a bit of back and forth where they would come, a few of the men would come to the women's drum circle. And then we would go to the police course and we did some teachable moments, but also we would do songs. Um, they would sing a song and we would sing a song. And then we asked if they would sing one of our songs. And because they tried, they tried. you know, lots of back and forth. And we actually said we need to eat together. We need to actually come together and just sit down and get to know each other um, outside of our roles as any singers. And, um, you know, and then to share while we are sharing food with one another. So to share more teachings, more stories in that process. I think, um seen that with my own eyes um, part of interesting relational because um, working with the First Nations communities the question that I always 
uh, being asked is, when are you coming back? And that's not an easy question because you, you we talked about that before. You have to be prepared to answer that uh, with, an, with an honest response answer, right? Um, and um, the very first time uh, was uh, working with Manitoba. Um, chief of the community asked me that question and asked, asked our team at the end of the meeting, when are you coming? And, and at that time, we didn't know because we, we need to plan uh, carefully. And, and you said that like uh, the relation in the case of your work was six years long for this particular project. Uh, so that talks about a different, uh, it's a different setting common research projects or projects where you go, yes. right? Like it's just, you're talking about six years long of relationship. I wonder if you can uh, talk about one of a uh, little bit of the challenges and ethical considerations, because you know, some, we, and we talk about that, some ethical boards might not, not find appropriate to have a relation with the participants in some cases. So what are your impressions or thoughts about that? Yeah, so I had ethical considerations in the research itself, but also in the submission of an ethics um, review with the uh, committee people, to, you know, to get that approval that's there. I felt like I had to do the whole uh, application process twice, um, <laughs> you know, because I answered it the way that I knew that I was being ethical. And um, so there were questions coming from the institution that either needed clarification or challenged me on my ethical right. ways. So um, example of this that's <clears throat> most significant to me is I would not have done the research if I didn't have relationships with all of the people, mm. including the women and girls and the police corps. I actually had to get to know them all and there were 70 of them. <laughs> and, and in our jump circle, um, probably at the time that we that the actual research studies happened, we had about 25 of our women and girls. And, um, and so it was a lot of getting to know each other um, through that process. And, uh, and it takes, it takes a lot of effort. And I think for me to ask people to be in a research project, um, they could only answer me really, if they knew me. Because otherwise, how do they know that they would trust that this information is going to be used in a good way and that is helpful for the people? You know, I guess maybe this is a good, I mean, there's so much now written about the uh, harms that have been done to Indigenous peoples, um, not just through colonization and uh, invasion, dispossession, and controls, um, but by researchers, and sometimes even still now, but um, for example, um, Western researchers would go into communities because they wanted to research something, not fully checking in with the people um, to, um, to enlist their support or whatever, but they would go in and get somebody's agreement um, but then they would leave and never give the results to the people or to um, in, ask the people if the interpretation of the results reflects accurately with them. And so that was really important for me to know in my research is if they said yes to the research and I said, so why are you saying yes to the research? I actually wanted to know this. And they said, because we know you, Kelly. We know that if you're saying um, that you're asking for us to be part of this research, that is, it is important, we think it's important, but you're going to do right by us. And if I hadn't had that relationship, um, I know that the Indigenous women and girls in particular would not have agreed to it. Um, a sideline thing, I just I'll make another note on that, is um, I teach... Um, I do some teaching, but one of the courses this spring is actually taking place in a federal prison. And so I bring um, outside um, university students inside to the prison, and I'm working with inside students who are taking university course credits. 
So this one in particular, it, the name of the course is mental health and substance use. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I, ha I had to interview all of the applicants inside and outside uh, students and um, and I asked them why they applied, the inside students, I asked them why they applied. And it was kind of an overwhelming response at that point. And that's because they said, well, we know you, Kelly. So, uh, because I drum with the individuals, um, sadly, the overrepresentation of Indigenous people in prisons is extraordinary. And uh, so, most of the people who come to my drum circles is. Indigenous, and they knew me from that context. And so they actually said, well, I haven't been in school for a long time, but I, I know that Kelly will support me. And they've reminded me of that. So I think it just affirms for me how important relationship building is there. But on the ethics review with the university, they talk about um, neutrality and objectivity and that the researcher is outside of their research subjects. I don't use that word, that's, that's, I don't use that word, um, the, the people. Um, but that was one thing I got called on with my, um, my, uh, my submission. And they said that they considered it unethical that I knew all my participants. And I said, well, it's completely unethical that I would do any research if I didn't know the people. And I said, because I know them all, I'm up to a higher level of ethics because I have to do right by them all the way through the research. If I don't or if I've harmed them, my relationship with them is, is ruined. And, uh, and that gets into community and, and then community is upset with me. And so it was very important for me to um, have those relationships and that they were um, that there was a trust there. And because they had trusted in me, and I consider Indigenous people and communities have a vulnerability when it comes to anyone doing research with them because of the um, potential for um, harms, to, yeah. harms to come to them. You know, again, back to some of the research that's happened is, um, you know, they have been told one reason for why a research project would happen. And so it might have, they might have been knowing it was, okay, we're going to test your blood work for your le the level of diabetes amongst Indigenous people in this part of the geographical region or whatever. But there was also an underhanded um, second motive for the research. So the blood samples were actually used in this particular case um, with the, um, the Hapsui people of Arizona with regard to um, looking at uh, schizophrenia and other mental health conditions. And the Indigenous people didn't know that, didn't know that. Um, and so some of those same types of things were done with um, the Neutral Nuth in Vancouver as well. And uh, so they were testing for certain kinds of conditions but they were also testing ancestry. That one particularly bothers me because there is a settler doubt of origins of indigenous people. So there's a real um, colonial narrative that is, is coming in there. And then just, you know, the numbers of sterilizations that have happened to indigenous women without you know, they've gone in for a medical procedure and then, you know, they've also had sterilizations um, and nutrition experiments without their, um, you know, that were created and harmful. Um, they were harmed by those nutritional experiments as well. So to me, um, and I think Indigenous scholars are very aware of these harms that have come to Indigenous peoples worldwide, but certainly North American Indigenous peoples, um, for sure. And so ethically, I have to go beyond. And I guess there's another piece to this whole, there's so many ethics pieces, but the usual tri-council tri ethics that we have to submit does not consider OCAP. 
with regard to indigenous peoples. Yeah. So ownership, control, access, and possession. Mm -hmm. And um, and it it's around indigenous peoples have to have ownership of the data and any information uh, related to them. And uh, and they and as you just mentioned that you know around self determination so, so and sovereignty over that information, as well as um, uh, control of how the information is used. So being fully informed, what is the intent of this this research project? How is the information going to be used? Where is it going to be stored? So that's around possession. So communities may say the university can store it but it's still under ownership of Indigenous peoples as well. Um, so that's really important. I recognize that, you know, in my research, it was urban based mm -hmm. and there are not clear guidelines for OCAP application with urban Indigenous people, Métis or Inuit, mm -hmm. just First Nations. But it doesn't mean we're off the hook because uh, as I was completing my research dissertation, my Indigenous advisor, um, you know, said that you, you still need to look at how those principles of OCAP apply in your research. So I uh, also thought that was really important and um, I made access of the research findings to everybody in my research study. And I also asked them for feedback. And so we actually had sharing circles where I would say, this is what I've got gathered from your transcripts. And what do you, what sense are you making out of this? I was very, I didn't want to make the interpretation with yes, of the data. Yes, yeah. Because that's a colonial harm mm -hmm. is we can come in with our Western lens and interpret, but we're actually to interpreting it through how we know the world to be. Um, and not how the people uh, see it. And I can't even presume to think that I understand another people outside of myself. Um, so I have to ask them, you know, how is this meaningful? What does this mean to you? Um, so those were really important um, for me to keep. And it was all about keeping relationships. So I wanted these people uh, to have, you know, I wanted these people to stay in my life and to keep these relationships that were there. And so that was how I needed to, to do right by them. That takes take us to the next um, point that I was planning to discuss. It is about colonial structures and narratives and how these or the legacy of those uh, in Western universities impact the experiences of indigenous scholars and students. And also um, how these uh, epistemologies limit or exclude the indigenous perspective within research and academia. And, uh, and also what strategies can we as scholars and students employ to navigate those challenges and to try to break down those colonial structures. Um, you're touching on something important, uh, everything that you said, but uh, the reciprocal relationships. So not about uh, just doing the research, then presenting the results but getting actual feedback, being open to really learn from the communities and their own interpretation of the information that is presented because sometimes we might uh, have our own assumptions. Uh, it happens to, it's, it is common to for, for some researchers to assume that all indigenous people are the same, which is not, not true. And, and those assumptions that, that could be made, um, I think are part of uh, these structures and narratives. So can you talk about uh, a little bit of that? Yeah, and just I'll spring off of the last point and then go back to some, but uh, you know, there's over 650 uh, First Nations communities across Canada. And so, you know, a, a local indigenous community here is gonna be different from um, Alberta or BC or Northwest Territories and they, even in one province communities are not all the same even if they're if I'm just talking with Anishinaabe communities I cannot even assume that two Anishinaabe communities are exactly going to be thinking the similar kinds of ways 
And so, again, without actually making a connection and relationship, I won't understand what's what's how they do things and what's relevant to them. So it is about, um, you know, that making those relational connections again. And there is one diagram that I wonder if it's helpful to uh, to to bring up. Um, one of the things when I think about the colonial structures, um, in all my courses, it doesn't matter at all what the topic is. I think three things, and this comes from my indigenous knowledges of how I know the world to be. Um, and it's about holism, interconnectedness, and relationships. Um, I cannot understand anything without seeing how it's connected to other things. Of course, there's things I may never know, but I have to see, you know, that I have to also realize that whatever I do or don't do is going to impact all else in creation in some kind of way. So even in, you know, whether I'm designing a research study um, or um, courses, uh, workshops or whatever, I look to see the components and how it's going to be holistically viewed, but also how all those pieces are, are interconnected with one another and how are they related? You know, what, how do all these pieces impact the relationships that are there? So if there's a diagram, yeah, I'll just pull that. Well, they'll pull it up for me. <laughs> So, um, so I don't really think linear because when I'm going on a trajectory of a line, I think I could leave a whole lot out. And so when I think um, circle, I think about inclusion. Actually, it has many teachings for um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, by the way. But um, that one circle, yeah, just the second second one there. So this diagram actually ended up being part of my research um, that I needed to do to kind of give me a picture of how I was going to lay out my research. And so just a couple of things about interpreting a circle. It actually is a map. And, um, you know, the circle shows that there's always movement and there's nothing left out of the circle. And, uh, you know, this actually connects to um, creation stories of Indigenous peoples, is that when I started out with telling you and giving thanks for the standing people, the stone people, all the winged ones, etc., they're actually my relatives. Because in the creation stories, I've been taught that creator created all of creation with kindness. And so with all those beings created, I'm one of those pieces that were created as well as a human being. And so the circle demonstrates that all of life is within the circle. No piece of anything is left out. In the center is the researcher. And this speaks to this idea um, too around, you know, what is our identity that comes into our research and because whether we acknowledge it or not it actually impacts all that we do the identity represents our world view whether it's colonial western for me it's indigenous people might have other identities you know even if they're they've always lived in Canada but they're closely connected to other cultures that's part of their identity and we don't just have one identity there's multiple but who are we and how do we come to the land where we live you know when we make um, land acknowledgments so I'm indigenous Sami and so not North American indigenous but I was born on in northern Ontario on Treaty 61 territory of the Robertson Huron and my grandfather was colonized um, in, you know, the residential schools are part of Sami people. But I have to recognize I'm settler. Even though born here, my, my people came from Europe. And so that tells me how I'm to relate to the land and to the first peoples. And so um, there will be things that I will not ever know 
about North American Indigenous peoples. And, um, but yet I've also um, had great connection to lots of Anishinaabe um, peoples. We can keep it on the first, second diagram. Yeah, thanks. Um, so that identity in the middle, it actually was a big part of my, my report. My research report, I think, was over 400 pages. Um, and this purple circle was actually a big part of that paper because my advisor for my research, um, in fact, I had five advisors um, on my research committee and two were Indigenous, oh, actually three were Indigenous. And, um, and so they asked me to dig deep in terms of, you know, why are you doing this research? And so through that process, um, actually I came across and I really had this researcher educator had a powerful impact on me. Uh, his name is uh, Dr. Ibrahim. And he talks, is one of his old articles, I think from 1996, is memory comes before knowledge. And so I had this desire to do this research project, but I know that Dr. Hampton would say, yeah, but Kelly, why? And so I had three layers to go through in understanding that. And I just said, well, I, um, I want to do this uh, research project with uh, Settler Police Corps and with uh, the Drum Circle. No, Kelly, that's not good enough. And so I dig another layer. Well, I wish for reconciliation between Indigenous and settler peoples. Well, it's getting better, but what else is there? What's the emotion? that's getting at your reason for your research. Because I want to feel like I belong in this land as a settler person in relation to Indigenous peoples. And so that was the emotional journey. I don't know if colonial structures of research allow this kind of personal journey to be part of the research. And that reason there was motivating me to do this research because I knew that it would be helpful also to myself to do these things in a good way. So all of who I am, um, I can't get rid of biases and assumptions. Um, as much as I learn and go to workshops and do all these trainings, I just naturally carry my own uh, biases and assumptions. Some are Western because I, done Western education and some are, you know, just being Indigenous and the assumptions that I carry because I have particular teachings, but not teachings of all Indigenous people. Um, so I could walk into stuff. I often talk about, um, I don't know what I don't know. And uh, so when I walk into spaces thinking I already know, then I'm going to do harm. If I presume that I think I got this, yeah. I'm going to just, I'm going to harm somebody because of reacting on my knowledge and not somebody else's. So in this diagram in the East, this uh, diagram goes in a uh, clockwise fashion and the work's never done. But in the East is all that began my research. And so in here as an Indigenous scholar, educator, I, I can't do research without acknowledging colonization. And uh, so then I end up having to recognize, well, how do I do decolonization in my research? And, um, and so those were really important for me. I do know, and I will say that there are Indigenous scholars who've chosen to no longer talk about colonization, that they just plant themselves in their own Indigenous research, because some will say, it's not my job anymore to explain to people what colonization is about. That's their homework to do. Um, so Indigenous scholars will vary in terms of how much do they teach the reader before beginning their, their work. And I guess that's an extra piece, eh, for Indigenous um, 
scholars, educators, researchers, is there's always a story before the story right. um, to help people come into the space. I just happen to be one who feels that um, because I teach in this area, there's still too many people that don't have the pre-knowledge mm -hmm. of the impact of colonization. So then the ethics um, that we've been talking about is still in that Eastern because that's the spirit that I bring to my research is the spirit of um, relationships, reciprocity, respect, um, re uh, responsibility and accountability. The research has to be relevant. Why, why would a community say yes? And my research searcher said to me when I wanted to do this research, how is that going to help people? And so that's why I asked the women and girls, um, how is this research going to help you? Because we wish for a future where our children, if they're in need, that they can go to the police and for our grandchildren. And I know that's a contested area, um, you know, but that's what this group of women and girls said. And I have to say, they got to see um, the men, and I have to put their identity um, because this actually became a something that I had a blind spot on for my own self. As much as I'm in my research and reflecting on all this, I was very aware to say the Indigenous women and girls, and my advisor said, you keep saying the police course. For they, they're men. Yeah, but, um, oh, they're white men who represent a police force. So that was, you know, the incredible power that started, I started to, you know, reflect on that power. And in listening to the stories of the women and girls, they really, they were very much aware of the, the power differences that came out there. So all the more reason to ensure that the relationships was at a good place before I could do the research. Hmm. Very interesting, yeah. Um, talking about universities and institutions, um, two questions that I have here is, uh, what steps can universities take and research institutions to make and support indigenous scholars and students within their own institutions? And also, how can research methodologies and practice can be decolonized to better accommodate indigenous voices? Yeah, decentering one kind of knowledge is really important in academia. You know, when in an academic institution that um, elevates learning and, and knowledge. Um, to elevate just one kind of knowledge is actually, I don't think, is good mm -hmm. diligence on the part of an institution. And so um, to recognize that people of all identities um, have, have knowledges and experiences. And I mean, it's such a rich experience when in classroom settings and in research, when we acknowledge that people come with many knowledges, even to recognize that knowledge is not just through research and literature, but knowledge comes from community people. And uh, yes, one of the areas that I also had to, I was challenged on in my research with the ethics people, is that knowledge would be coming through dreams, through smudging, um, through ceremony, through fasting on the land. I did lots of that. Um, and or through drumming and so they said well that's not a proof of knowledge base and um, and I said but we already know it is um, and so there was a lot of back and forth so I had to it's still challenging because I find I have to talk the language um, of an institution for them to understand um, especially when they hold power to say yes or no like funders, um, as well as ethical ethics review bodies. There's some changes, but there's a long ways to go. Like earlier when we mentioned um, research, 
often has a start and a finish time yeah. and it's within a time frame and it's typically a short time frame mm -hmm. so funding bodies are still oriented to be done you get your funding year to year three years yes and so if things take longer then it's a, it's a, it can be problematic or things have to finish up or the research is caught in this situation um, with the community says they're not ready for that, but my funder says, well, you gotta, you gotta finish up. And so sometimes a lot of um, further explanations are needed to get extensions on funding or the funding closes. And uh, my supervisor, my advisor was in some of those circumstances um, as well. And so when you have relationships with the participants, um, you choose the participants over the funding. Mm -hmm. So that has some, yeah, it has consequences. That's a big challenge, right? As I said, when are you coming back later? Yes. Question yeah. that I've answered, right? Yeah. So I wonder if the audience has online or, I know I got a, you're monitoring the Q and A's also, but I want this to be so. If you if you have any questions or reflections at this point uh, here in the learning circle or online, uh, please just open up your microphone online or here if you want to share here. Uh, or we will come to the final questions. Um, there, there isn't a question from the um, audience, but uh, a couple of statements. So uh, one of our current participants, Jelena Haynes, I hope I pronounced your name right, um, said um, that sh they were asked the same question from their cultural mentors. What were the reasons for their research? Um, and they had to use a metaphor of weaving to connect their research to the land and its people. Um, Kim Delat, says that it's ironic that indigenous researchers in particular have to adhere to bureaucratic colonized procedures to obtain ethics approval and ethics is in quotation marks there um so there were there were a couple of other comments throughout um but not a question that i see as yet i will however give a shout out we actually had a participant from australia joining us today and it's midnight over there so thanks for joining thank you for joining us today um there is something there's a question from uh, melissa green i think it's pronounced an issue i have had to address in the last year in my role as a role, role as a pfnr chair uh, and as a native scholar is the use of indigenous standpoint theory by non-native scholars. What are your thoughts on this? I'm not sure if I know what standpoint theory is. Um, Melissa? Uh, oh, yes. It's presented by Nancy Hartstall. And according to her point of view, because knowledge is situated, therefore, we should know about the standpoint of indigenous people, what they are thinking, what's their point of view, and what are their feelings and emotions. This is the standpoint theory. Yes, and uh, actually I'm doing work on feminist standpoint theory that was presented by uh, Harstock. And uh, uh, actually I was having a question also. I'm from uh, a colonized area, I'm from Pakistan. And uh, I'm using that standpoint theory to bring about the standpoint of Pakistani women, Pakistani Anglophone literature. So uh, is it only one, per one perspective that epistemology or uh, uh, epistemology emerge from the outsider or epistemology can be created by the indigenous girls or women also? Is it so? Well, it's a very good question. I appreciate that. It's interesting that when you explain it, what you're saying makes sense to me. It's interesting how word and language, right? Shifts. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's all um, that's all good. And um, but early indigenous um, researchers and scholars were doing indigenous research, interestingly enough, but from a from a colonial lens. I don't know if you know the indigenous researcher Linda Tuey Smith. Um, from, she's uh, Maori from New Zealand, 
And so she's talked about in her books how uh, early Indigenous scholars were doing research with their own people, which would seem good, but they were still framing their research from the Western yes. colonial lens. Yes. yes, yep. And now Indigenous scholars, and, she, and so Linda continues the dialogue in her books around how Indigenous scholars need to kind of like wake up and so and to re uh recenter themselves and their identities and know that how they're being colonized themselves and to decolonize their very being their identity so to situate themselves in their own identity and, and location where they are on the land and to utilize their own knowledges and experiences to do to orient their research from their perspective and so i wonder if standpoint theory like my whole research was a story. Um, yes, I did the literature reviews and all those pieces, but I talked in first person in my research. And uh, so that whole idea of how I talked about when Eber Hampton prompts in his literature for the researcher is, you know, what, what prompted you to, uh, to do that research is, is for the researcher to do reflexivity. So to, so to dig deep and to look within to see what sparks the research, because that ends up being a thread throughout the whole research process. Um, and I would come right back to that in the beginning as well, because I actually asked myself at the end of my research if I felt like, like I had a feeling of belonging at the end of this research. So I was, you know, here I am gathering the stories from all the participants, but I realized I'm actually one of that drum circle. Like they were my, they were, they were my uh, sisters and, um, and children. We were all in that drum circle. So then I also had to question my own power that's in there because I, you know, I'm related to them in the sense that we've been drumming together for a lot of years. Um, I also realized I had a relationship with the police corps, but they themselves coming from a Western lens didn't actually question my researcher identity at all. And um, so I was very conscious with the women and girls. And so I actually talked with them and I talked with the men too, but in the sharing circles that were separate with just the women and girls, I, I said, you know, how do you feel about me being the researcher in this, you know, like I know all of you, but I'm doing the research with that. And again, they reminded me, well, it's because we know you, Kelly, that uh, we know you're going to do right by this information you're gathering. And, um, and I also, they were very aware, I was accountable to the institution. Like I had to, to talk about that and I had to submit. And I guess another ethics thing for me, I really did not want to. Um, for me with the women and girls, I would have just offered tobacco in a, in a cloth. And uh, that's a reciprocity that I put my prayers in, and and, um, best of wishes for this research project and giving thanks to them for participating and I would offer them this tie. Um, it's just a little square cloth and you put a pinch of tobacco. We believe that when that tobacco is burned, all that my wishes would be burned and go in the smoke to creator. So we all knew that. But the institution was saying, you got to get those forms signed, <laughs> um, get the confidentiality forms. Did you get the ones about signing for recording? And, and I mean, it, the forms are huge. Um, so we did both and we all had a chuckle on that. Um, you know, just recognizing that uh, they knew that, yes, Kelly works at the institution um, for that with the men. You know, I still offered them tobacco because they knew what that was about, but they were quite ex acceptable with the paper, papers that were there. So as much as standpoint theory goes is I weaved myself throughout the whole research process, you know, constantly 
uh, realizing that at times I was in, like when we were going and singing with the police chorus, I was just one of the drum circle. And then here I am, the next day we could be meeting in circle going, okay, I have a research question. But, but we also did ceremony. We actually set up as if we were doing our regular drum circles, we actually set up ceremony with smudging and, and at times during the sharing when it was difficult for them to talk because some of them had um, harmful experiences with police and they were sharing and people were crying is that we lit the smudge and then we just took our breaks and continued on. And, um, and I helped. I think an ethical thing for me too is I had um, not all the participants were together. Like the police chorus had their own circles and the uh, women and girls had their own circles because especially for the women and girls, their vulnerability, they might not have shared in the same way if they had been with the uh, white male settler police chorus. And that's important to frame their identity. Um, if I could, sure. from a, a few reactions online, <laughs> um, Melissa, who asked the original question, says, yet in the blind pre-review process for the required pre-tenure publication quarter, I must constantly choose whether or how to self-identify in my writing, a similar experience to yours. Then I'm told my work isn't really media history and that it is better suited for an indigenous journal again i'm, I'm using quotations mm -hmm. here as melissa is in her writing uh we also um i want to give a shout out to cherry muslim i hope you pronounced that correctly um they are joining us from south africa uh and had mentioned bagela chalisa i believe the, ma the name is from botswana uh, who also writes on Indigenous research methods. Um, and um, there's a couple of shout outs to that research. It's very interesting uh, perspective bringing uh, in from there. Thanks. I have two, two points on that. I actually, um, uh, I've, I've published some articles and um, I was as, I mean, I'm older in my life, I guess, and I was quite excited to even think I was writing an article, a journal article, and, um, and I wanted to write it on my research, and I really took an incredible amount of time to figure out the right journal. I really wanted to be published in this. It was um, just a very popular academic journal, and I guess it had a bit of a steam connected to it, and I thought, it would be so great. Um, but they gave me similar feedback to the person on the call. <laughs> and they wanted me to rewrite it. And actually, actually, they had told me that some of the things that I was writing about was uh, incorrect, and that I needed to reframe um, as, as a, they were non-Indigenous telling me as an Indigenous scholar that the way I was framing my wording uh, was not appropriate and uh, to consider another journal. And so it was actually devastating for me. You know, if we look at changes that needs to happen, um, because institutions actually really support, and in fact, I guess it's part of um, tenure and all of that, right, is to publish articles and how much do we reaffirm colonial ways of seeing knowledge, like as indigenous, because I think those comments are do harm, right? As it's lesser than go to an indigenous knowledge, uh, our indigenous journal. journal. And, um, you know, so unless you hit the right words, people don't even always see the indigenous journals that are there. Um, and so that segregation really to me is quite harmful. I wonder if I could show, because I wanted to kind of go to a point on the metaphor, and there is a second diagram um, on my point, PowerPoints, um, to just show. One second. Okay. And there we are. Yes. So I just wanted to show that this. Um, metaphor is the diagram 
that formed my research findings. And actually this diagram needed to happen before I wrote my paper, before I wrote my 400 pages. <laughs> um, is I actually had to get the, the vision in my mind. And so I researched what other indigenous scholars were doing and I was wonderfully pleased to see how many were using metaphors in their research to show you know, relationship and connectedness of um, participant stories and findings and, um, and the representation through metaphor. And so uh, for me, that's really important. I guess I think in pictures. And uh, so these were things that were coming in. That braid just uh, as what forms the outside there, the colors are purposely chosen as well as the white. So there's blue, green, and white. Uh, the blue, our police services represent blue. Mm -hmm. um, and green really is about connected to the land, but the indigenous women and girls. And the white is the purity of the relationship or the respect of that relationship. And so it's also braided because in an urban setting, indigenous and settler peoples and even police are intertwined with each other. Yeah. You know, even people living on in reserved communities are intertwined when they're coming to urban settings. So we can't help but be, um, impacted by each other's experiences. So each other's knowledges, experiences is shifting and shaping all the time. Um, even those in the room, you know, were, were, if everyone had opportunity to share your experiences, we would all be shifted because of those things. So nothing is ever standing still. I've been asked a lot about the dichotomy that you see in this metaphor that there's police and there's indigenous women and girls. Mm -hmm. And I also, we had an indigenous police officer, yeah. female with our drum circle. So I realized that identities are not just one or the other, mm -hmm. but they're often inter, intermingled. But the reason I chose dichotomy, and I had to defend that because it came up at my defense, <laughs> um, is really the power the power difference um, that represented white male police. So power and authority. And so the women and girls throughout all of their stories um, recognize that power. In fact, there, it, one teeny weeny piece of my research finding that still hits me that to this day when I was listening to all their words and trying to make sense, there was something about respect. And um, when I asked, when I listened to the men's stories and they said, well, you gotta have respect. Of course, there's gonna be respect if there's gonna be a relationship that's sustained. So it was an automatic given. They had not even conceived that there wouldn't be respect. That is a settler privilege, white settler privilege. Mm -hmm. You have to have respect. For the women and girls, their question that they ask, do you think that they will respect this? It, it, it wasn't a given. You know, to actually ask that means that their life experiences um, were different. Yeah. So in the end, that's why I chose uh, that dichotomy. There are seven little fires. I don't know if the, the diagram probably doesn't do it justice, but if you look really closely, it's uh, wood Inside. with the fire. <laughs> yeah. And there's seven fires. And actually, those were the ethics that came out of the research. Um, this is actually, I guess, a really important kind of critical point. Oh, there you go. Um, that worldview impacts how we interpret the data. So when I was going through all the stories, because people were sharing stories, it wasn't surveys, it was sharing circles, is um, I heard these words over and over again. And I had to reflect on this because I said, am I hearing them? Because 
this is really the representation or am I hearing and interpreting because of my indigenous lens? Mm -hmm. So I heard love, not really love, but caring, um, honesty, respect, courage, humility, wisdom, and, and uh, truth. And I don't know if you know where those come from, but they're Anishinaabe teachings. They're called the seven sacred teachings about how to be a good human being. And so the Indigenous women and girls were saying, well, there has to be, you know, the, we've got to have the courage to speak up because how will things change? And we got to be able to care for each other, you know, all these things. And the men were saying the same things, but in their own words, they didn't know that they were using the Anishinaabe teachings, um, but it came out. So it is something for a researcher to question um, the arrival of those seven, because that's the ethics that actually instill for me the kind of relationships that have to happen between Indigenous and settler peoples and Indigenous peoples and the police is those seven sacred teachings. Um, and so I, I brought those interpretations back to the men and the women. We actually met as one big circle at the end and they said, yes, those fit Kelly. <laughs> uh, so I got my affirmation there, um, but that's just, you know, the researcher is always in it, you know, and, and reflecting and questioning back. And I think there's no other way to be. Because then we own our subjectivity, that we actually can't be objective or neutral. We, we, we just can never be. And yet academia says that it's possible. Um, I wonder if there's another question here or uh, because I know we need to finish the session soon. So maybe we can talk about your hopes for the future and uh, what um, if you have any advice or recommendation for any students or scholars that would like to get engaged in this type of research and also engage with research and projects. This closely connects, I guess, uh, you know, my hope for the future. Uh, Another area, I guess, that is a big interest of mine is around the truth and reconciliation uh, work. And the president of University of Waterloo has made a bold affirmation of the TRC calls to action when we had the, um, the big event in September. Um, and, um, and, and the president had acknowledged that the that the university does need to step up to, um, to, to move in that direction. What that means on the individual level and for any researchers, of course, is before we can do research, the ethical thing I think is we have to start with ourselves, mm -hmm. is knowing who we are and our identity, tracing our ancestry back and how did we, if we are settler, how did we arrive to the land? I know settler is a contested word, um, you know, because people may have had family here for generations, but in the end, people have come here through enslavement and also refugee and other, you know, um, harmful experiences that they are fleeing from to come here. But there is a point when people settle here on this land and make it their home, that they become complicit in the ongoing colonization that's here. And so unless we become part of the decolonial um, TRC project, we're still kind of reaffirming colonization um, for that. So um, being non-Indigenous means we've come from somewhere else. And so that, that acknowledgement, I think, is so important for how we enter into relationships with Indigenous peoples, but any people that who are our participants. Yeah. Is, is knowing something about their identities as well. And I guess the other piece, um, um, at the university, uh, I've been teaching, I'm actually a sessional lecturer, so a long time sessional lecturer, 15 years, and um, I'm still seeing 
students in my classes. I teach mostly in social work areas at two, at actually two universities. And I'm still seeing students who talk about not having much exposure to Indigenous peoples, like to actual people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a colonial thing too, to not see oneself in relation to Indigenous peoples. Um, and uh, so to, they, they also don't know the history very well, or to, they may not understand how is the history connected to them. Uh, so if people were more, you know, pursued more education in that area, I think that could help build better relationships. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Kelly and everyone. We are at the end of our session. Um, we're going to stick around for a few minutes here. If you have questions or if you want to talk, just with uh, Kelly or between us and also for our audience online. Thank you so much. Uh, please stay tuned to this next series of uh, workshops and events that the committee on uh, equity, diversity and inclusion we have. And uh, Just a, a note for both in person and our online audience. This is the last event of the series in the spring. spring. However, and we this is the eighth event in the part one of the series. We will restart um, them in September. There will be another eight um, <clears throat> events uh, in this in this very long and uh, extremely, I think, um, helpful um, series to everyone. And over the summer, we will be releasing recordings <clears throat> from the events that have happened since uh, January. Uh, so take a look on the Games Institute website. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing everyone back in the fall with us in September. Um, the dates will be announced on the website as well as our social media. Um, so thank you so much. And again, uh, shout out to our international audience who was here in such a uh, long time, uh, long, uh, late hours, wherever they are. Thank you very much.